Um, so thanks for coming. Um, you know, when I, I first uh, submitted this to Jim uh, as a talk, he kind of said, what does this have to do with the cloud? Um, it really, uh, I'm going to talk about the disinformation, in particular real-time search poisoning. And really, if you think about it, platform as a service is one particular area that you don't hear a lot about cloud. When you hear about the cloud, everybody thinks of infrastructure as a service. So, you know, pulling up instances, running instances. When really, actually, the biggest cloud is really web services, as, uh, as Hoff was uh, finishing up with there, which is a good transition. Because web services are really all around, or mostly around, information and data. So really, if you think about traditional search today, it's really about relevance with a sprinkle of prevalence. You know, how often are people linking to each other? What's, what's the most popular thing that I'm searching for? And depending on who you talk to, Ask Jeeves, Bing, whatever it may be, they now talk about intent. Um, today, we see almost 14% of all tradi traditional searches actually for very high topic buzz keywords um, or uh, news events are actually leading to malware. Um, and uh, actually, the biggest uh, people that are involved in this are rogue antivirus uh, folks. But I'm not going to really go into those details. There's been a lot of presentations about that in the past. I'm going to talk about real-time search. So real-time search is really all about time, trends, with a sprinkle of social graph and now geography and location-based services. So it's changed quite a bit. Um, and there's some pretty good quotes from uh, the head of search at Yahoo. You know, the, what, the most interesting one to me was really the sheer amount of data that presents the unique challenges for search. Um, because the data is non-authoritative, you know, who knows who it could be, it's noisy, it's, and it's spammy. So these search engines have to build a trust model to determine what's important and influential in real time, which is a really hard thing to do. As far as real-time search vendors, one real hot area, you know, besides mobile, um, you know, as far as VC goes, real-time search is big. You know, Scoopler, OneRiot, Thura, Collecta, uh, there's all kinds of them out there. You know, go research it in your own. But really, do we really know what real-time search is used for yet? I think most people don't actually know that they're using real-time search. Sometimes they just search on Google or something, they see that little bar come up with a bunch of data, you know, just showing up in real-time. They don't really understand what's going on. Where's that data coming from? What am I using that for? And there's all kinds of uses for real-time search um, that really are not being explored or will be explored in different interesting ways. And secondly, and most important, obviously, for this presentation is really, have we thought about the security models of real-time search? And I think the answer is not really, because we don't really know what the uses are. It's really hard to think through some of the models. So some of the big problems with real-time search as I see it today. The first one is the most obvious, which is most of the web services out there are easy and open. Anyone can use them, anyone can register, anyone can write the code. I mean, not anyone, but <laughs> most people um, can write code to connect to a web service. It's not hard. A lot of the actual application stack is, is removed from things previously. Um, also, the data must be delivered in real time, which leaves very little time to filter the data that's being presented. Unlike traditional shirts, which you have these huge algorithms that are being turned in the back, which can spit out bad data from bad locations, real-time search time is, is critical. So applying algorithms in real time is really hard. Not only that, it's very short in nature. You want the data in real time, then it goes away. You don't care about what happened yesterday or two hours ago. You want what's, uh, what's there today. Also, the amount of data is staggering. If you pull any of the firehose feeds from some of these vendors, I mean, we're talking about double-digit growth every couple weeks in data, so massive amounts of data. And to me, one of the most interesting ones is Joe the Plumber can compete with CNN. Um, you know, Twitter really changed the way that news is being delivered. Um, you know, I think one of the most compelling events was, uh, you know, was it Sully, the, the guy that landed the plane in, in the harbor in New York? That was all Twitter and TwitPic feeds that made the news. It wasn't a CNN reporter or USA Today or someone on the street. It was actually just Joe Schmo sitting there. So there's this whole idea that, that um, a lot of the search engine and the real-time people talk about, which is basically quality plus relevance equals truth. And that is a really big statement. I mean, how do you possibly attribute truth to information on the web, anonymously in real time? Really, really difficult problem. In fact, in, in meat space, it's really hard to know if someone's lying. So if you're looking in someone's eyes and you're trying to figure out if they're telling you something that's a lie, how do you do that in, in a virtual world where you don't even know who's doing the information from where? So I'm going to go over kind of three areas that um, we experimented with. Uh, the first one is time and trend hacks. The second one is geography-based hacks. And the last one is social graph hacks. 
Um, the first one is time and trends. And this is really how real-time search really started to, to pick up, and that was with Twitter. Um, so some of the things you can do, actually, is most real-time search engines today are incredibly simple. It's basically whoever had the, most, the last post on something is at the top. And then it goes down in a scroll. It's basically tail minus F on your logs. So some of the things you can do is grab the top trends and simply post tweets linking to malicious sites. That's pretty simple. Um, you can post for multiple accounts with multiple URLs going to multiple sites because some of them check to see if the same user is posting over and over again. Um, you can post with images. Um, some of the uh, real-time search engines actually will give you, as you'll see later, will give you more ranking if you have an image assigned to your, your post. Um, you can pause and post because some of them actually check to see if you're posting within a certain amount of time. So you could post something, you know, hey, you know, I'm at Black Hat. Here's a URL. Two minutes later, hey, I'm at Black Hat. Here's a different URL. And then you can also predict future events and uh, post tweets um, to be first. Or for some people that look back in time, you could be that first person. So let's look at some of the examples. And I'm not sure these come up very well on the screen, but, but I'll explain them. So when we first started our experimenting, um, it was the morning of the Boston Marathon. Um, so we thought, hey, what's going on in the news? Hey, the Boston Marathon's today. I, I think it was a Monday, because they, they run it during the week, um, which was convenient enough. So uh, we started um, posting things uh, through, through the real-time web uh, all about the Boston Marathon. And the first thing we did is basically just, hey, we want to be first. We want to be first in the role. Let's see if, they, if we can even register with Twitter. Um, you know, so there was, you know, hey, hi, uh, there was also, actually, I should step back. The leader of the Boston Marathon at the time was this kid named Ryan Hall, who's an American kid trying to win the Boston Marathon for the US. So we saw, hey, people are probably searching a lot about Ryan Hall. He's got a lot of chance to win this. So we started saying, hey, I'm running with Ryan Hall in the Boston Marathon. Or, hey, you know, Ryan Hall's winning. And we ended up first in the list. We did it again. We ended up second in the list. And we were posting to, you know, OK links, not uh, malicious links, of course. Um, we also noticed that um, we could actually say things like, hey, I, finished, I just finished the Boston Marathon before the actual marathon was over. And it would show it up, you know, top finisher or, you know, winner of Boston Marathon up in the results. Uh, the next one was we also realized that this was also happened to be the weekend or the morning of the volcano in Iceland. Um, those of you who are Black Hat Europe that were stuck over there would remember this. Um, so we actually thought, okay, well, the two top stories today are the Boston Marathon and the volcano. What if I combine some information about those two events and start posting tweets and posting things in the social web about it? So we started, uh, you know, if people were doing searches, believe it or not, people were, were typing in things like, couldn't go to the Boston Marathon due to the volcano, you know. Unfortunately, I couldn't make it because of the volcano. So we just posted information about that, and we came up in the top ranks uh, based off of that information. The next one was we, we, uh, we realized actually in some of them we couldn't get up. Topsy and Collect in particular, it was hard to get up. They were actually filtering out our data. We didn't have enough followers or there was some reason. So we just posted pictures of ourselves. We just posted, you know, that was me running the marathon. Um, so we said, hey, I'm running the Boston Marathon. Here's a picture. And we ended up uh, third, and I think it was in the top two um, in these two engines. Um, and then lastly, as I was saying, we predicted the future, the f the future winner. So at one time, the, 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 uh, the, the actual um, person that was supposed to win was this African guy, or Kesso. Um, we actually posted that he won the marathon before he won the marathon. Eventually, he won the marathon. But if you go back in time, you'll see that we posted that first. Our links are the first ones that say, this guy won the marathon. And it was actually before the actual marathon was finished. So we are the first point of record on the winner. And then the last one we played around with, this is at a different time. This is during the, um, there was some, some protests in Phoenix around the, uh, the new law they had in, in uh, Arizona uh, around uh, immigrants. Um, and we realized, you know, we, we actually couldn't, with Google was actually doing things a little bit smarter than some of the other engines. Um, but then we actually made a mistake and we actually spelled Phoenix wrong. And then we realized, wow, a lot of people probably spell Phoenix wrong. So you just typed in Phoenix at P-H-E-O-N-I-X and we ended up uh, in the first. So the standard typo attacks of yesteryear still work fine. So the next area was social graph hacking. Um, and this is really one of the big hot areas along with geography and location-based services. Um, and some real-time search providers are really attempting to map your social graph, and that's really where the money is in the social space today, into their algorithms. Um, so really, the social graph, as far as um, most of the engines go, is really around who's following you, who are you following, um, and, uh, and how that whole social graph is being built. Um, 
So some things you can do is get people to follow you. I'll show you how we did that. Um, you could see the engines with good posts over time. This will get you a good reputation as a user. You know, if, hey, if you're just posting stuff, you're good. You've got a great reputation. Then all of a sudden you go bad. Um, the next one is to take control of good accounts. Um, some some well-known people's Twitter accounts have been compromised. And the last one is to link accounts across data streams. And I'll show an example of that, like Facebook, MySpace, Twitter, all together. Some of the engines are actually building profiles across the social web um, in order to map their algorithms. So the social graph really today is really about who are you, who do you know, um, who do they know, who are you following, who are they following, and who's following you, and where are you? And every one of these dimensions has a security problem, but most importantly, every one of these dimensions has a revenue opportunity. So not for the bad guys, but for the good guys. So this huge amounts of um, venture capital in this and a lot of startups that are doing this type of stuff. So the first thing we started uh, researching was how do we get people to follow us on Twitter? Um, and one, one of our researchers noticed that, hey, one of the easy things is you can just go on eBay and buy followers. So for 99 cents, you can get like 1,000 followers on eBay. Um, and uh, so we bought some followers, and our ranking actually went up immediately just based off of the fact that we bought followers. Who knows who the people were, you know, probably spam accounts or whatever else, but, you know, for 99 cents, it was a good investment. Um, the next one is a really interesting one that just blew me away when I first actually stumbled upon it, and this is this, um, this company, Adly. Uh, I don't know, has anyone heard of Adly? I'm sure you've heard of Bitly, maybe not Adly. So Adly is this, <laughs> this notion of celebrities and people that will tweet and you can pay them to tweet information. Um, so actually, this is the role of, of Adly. You're supposed to be an approved advertiser. I signed up, I got approved, I became an advertiser. And uh, the top people, believe it or not, charge as much as $10,000 per tweet. I think um, like, uh, like Dr. Drew was up there, um, the Kardashian sisters, TechCrunch. Of all people, TechCrunch. You can pay TechCrunch to tweet on your behalf. Um, so really, you can reach a lot of people if you have the money. Or when you get down the roll, I didn't include my presentation, but Cheech and Chong, actually, you can, <laughs> it was uh, 420, I think was the date, and they were the big, uh, <laughs> they were the big posters for obvious reasons. Um, so for like 200 bucks, you could get Chong to post a, a tweet for you. Um, the one I found was, uh, this was also during the NBA playoffs, uh, Paul Pierce from the Celtics. Um, you know, I was trying to find who was actually paying these people. Um, so it looks like uh, the, the makers of the, the um, you know, the hit, Death at the Funeral, <laughs> um, paid uh, Paul Pierce to post a tweet during the, uh, the playoffs. Um, and, you know, it does say ad in brackets, but I'm not sure how many people um, uh, look at that. The, the good thing is that um, they use Bitly for this. I'm not sure if Adly and Bitly are connected, but, I um, mean, with Bitly, of course, you can add a plus at the end of the URL to see how many people go to the links. So this, I don't know if they actually paid $5,700 for this. Maybe he has some deal with them on the side. But I looked at the results, and really there was only, uh, sorry, there was only 1,200 people that actually visited the site within the first 10 minutes. So really not all that successful. A more economical way is to actually hack or, hack or compromise somebody's Twitter account. So Guy Kawasaki's account was compromised. Um, I'm not sure what the, the truth was in the whole thing, but apparently someone sniffed his password through TweetDeck or one of the Twitter applications and then posted pornography links. Um, and uh, he's got like a quarter of a million viewers, so he's, he's a pretty big Twitter user. So how, how then we got uh, people to follow you? Um, it's actually pretty easy to get people to follow you. Um, one of the things to do is actually look for spammers. Um, so spammers will always follow you because they're doing the same thing that you're experimenting with. Um, that's not hard to do. Um, the next one is to look for people who are clearly auto-following. So if you look a lot of people, a lot of people used to have that automatic auto-follow on that thankfully Twitter took off, but a lot of the Twitter apps still allow you to auto-follow. Someone follows you, you automatically just follow them regardless of who they are. Um, so if you follow the auto-followers, they'll follow you, and that will bump up your reputation. Um, the next one, and the one that we thought was really sad, but actually it worked really well, is you just add an account that has socially timely characteristics. Hey, I'm a fan page of Britney Spears, or, you know, following, you know, this celebrity or whatever. People will automatically, and then just join a group, they'll start following you. Um, but one of the recommendations we have is actually to not necessarily use the API. Um, because the API does have throttles um, that I'll show you. But you actually can simulate clicks a little bit easier, just like you're a user and you're actually using the interface, like a web browser, versus using the APIs because those security controls don't exist or appear to exist um, like they do in the other one. So for us to get 400 followers actually took three days. Um, we actually had to trickle our followers and our followings or else we would get bumped pretty quickly. So